Calculating ICERs, here's a few examples. If we have intervention A and intervention B and we know the total costs of A and the total effects of A, and the same for B. When we're talking total costs, we're talking everything in, including the price tag of, say, the drug, as well as the costs induced by its side effects, hospitalizations, other resource utilization within the healthcare system, etc. The types of costs that we put into total costs for A and B really depends on the perspective of the economic analysis that we're undertaking. So we have total costs A and B, and what we want to calculate is the ICER, which is shown at the bottom here. The incremental cost per incremental effect. We do not want to make a decision or stop at calculating the average cost effectiveness ratio for A and B. So here we have an example of a new drug B versus standard drug A. And uh, for example, we know that the drug actually um, imparts an extra half year of life. And in this case, many um, hospitals, for example, would want to make a decision on that drug. However, it's very difficult to make a decision about whether or not that drug B is worth it because we don't have the costs associated with it here. So let's look at this. Once we have the costs of B versus A, what we can do is calculate the ICER. And it very, is very simple. We take the difference in costs in the numerator divided by the difference in effects in the denominator. We calculate the ICER. In this case, it's $4,000 per additional life year gained. Here's another example new medication here is more effective and less costly. Drug B, more effective and less costly. So now we're actually in the southeast quadrant, which is very easy to make a decision. We should take that up into practice a very good deal compared with what we had in practice standard of care, drug A. Example three. Let's say we had more than one comparative for example, for acid suppressant drugs. Well, what we can do is line them up, calculate all their costs, calculate their average effects. Here we're talking about number of disease-free days. And yes, we can calculate their ACER for each individual drug, but of course we're not going to stop there, and neither are we going to make a decision based on that ACER. What we need to do is, is actually plot the cost per effect or the ACER for each of those drugs on the cost effectiveness plane. So here we're actually calculating or plotting the ACER for drug A, B, C, and D on the plane. And because we do this, we can see once we join up the efficiency frontier, which is those drugs which have the most effect for the least cost, so those that are furthest to the right and bottom, we join them up to make a frontier. And because we are looking now at the cost per effect, when we join up each of these most if, um, cost, or sorry, when we um, increase, when we join up When we plot these on this graph and uh, join them, what we are doing is calculating um, or revealing the ICER because the slope between treatment B versus C, for example, actually represents the delta C over delta E, which is the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. What we can do then on this efficiency frontier is take a look at which options joined up have the lesser slope, which means that it is the lesser ICER. So in this particular case, if we were only considering these four options, we would consider that treatment B um, versus C is actually a better deal than choosing treatment A.
example four. Here's one from our own hospital where we looked at off-pump coronary artery bypass versus con um, conventional coronary artery bypass. So off-pump uh, is doing surgery without the bypass pump and uh, conventional is doing it on the typical bypass pump for open heart surgery. And here we calculated the costs over the lifetime, over the horizon of a lifetime for doing off-pump bypass surgery versus conventional coronary artery bypass surgery. And we also calculated the qualies. Now we had to do this by bringing in some data beyond that available from clinical trials because the clinical trials were actually of a short-term horizon. So we had to model what would happen over the long term based on what we saw happening from the shorter term trials. And there are certainly are limitations with having to model over the, the long term, but it is the best that we have. And so here we have delta C and delta quali based on the quality adjusted life years from the clinical trials plus modeled over the lifetime. And what we found was an ICER of minus 76,950. When you see a negative ICER, what you have to do is trace back and figure out which quadrant on the cost-effectiveness plane you are. In this case, because it is cost-saving and the qualities are improved or positive with off-pump versus on-pump, we're the best of both worlds. Again, it's cost-saving and it's more effective, so we're actually in that quadrant, which is very easy to make a decision. We should take it up into practice. I need to add a caveat here though. The evidence has moved on since we did this economic analysis and we need to redo this economic analysis because some of our assumptions in our modeling about the impact over the long term are now shown to be incorrect. But here's an example then of what we can do given the fact that any of the parameters within our economic analysis also have confidence intervals around them and uncertainties around them and different distributions of possible effects. So what we do when we do an economic analysis is we do sensitivity analyses and we run, run bootstraps um, uh, and we do probabilistic sensitivity analysis across the plausible ranges of all those variables and run bootstrapping with multiples of iterations to figure out what the plausible range and spread of possible ICERs really is and where they concentrate. In this one, for example, I've plotted on the cost-effectiveness plane the range of ICERs that we found from our model of off-pump versus on-pump bypass surgery. And you can see I've drawn there the threshold ICER of the willingness to pay around $50,000 per quality. Again, not that that's set in stone, it's just a benchmark, but it shows you here that most of the results came out below the ICER, and in fact 80% of the bootstrap points came below the ICER, meaning that the probability that given the assumptions in this model, which are imperfect now that the evidence has moved on, but given the assumptions in this model, it is about 80% likely that the new OCAB is actually cost-effective compared with the old. And then we can calculate a cost-effectiveness acceptability curve given that bootstrapping scatter plot and figure out what the likelihood of the new option being cost-effective is compared with the old option across different willingness to pay thresholds. So in closing, what does cost-effectiveness mean? Well, if a strategy is deemed cost-effective, it really just means that the new strategy is a good value based on some theoretical willingness to pay. Being cost-effective does not necessarily mean that the strategy saves money, and just because a strategy saves money doesn't mean that it's cost-effective. That elusive threshold ICER is out there, but we're not exactly sure where it lies or where it should lie. It's a range, and it really depends. So cost-effectiveness really is in the eye of the beholder. To whom? 
when we're doing cost-effectiveness analyses, we have to understand that the very notion of cost-effectiveness requires a value judgment. What you think is a good price for additional outcome, someone else may not. Perspective really matters. And as you know, it's not only the cost and the effect that's important. There's also the values of the patients and society that, that come into play. So in closing then, here's a quote from Michael Drummond, a health economist from York in the UK, and he he captured this very clearly. It is best to think of the cost-benefit approach as a way of organizing thought rather than as a substitute for it. And that's really what economic analysis is. It's really just one tool in our toolkit for decision-making to illuminate a decision, but definitely not to be a substitute or to make it automatic in any way. Thank you.